So this video is over pulmonary system medications. The pulmonary system is responsible for respiration. You know, it's the process of inhaling oxygen into the bloodstream and exhaling the waste in the form of carbon dioxide. The muscular skeletal system also helps with the process. The diaphragm, which is a large muscle under the stomach, contracts and the lungs are compressed and CO2 is expelled up through the bronchial tubes and trachea out of the mouth and into the air. This is expiration. The now mostly empty lungs inhale oxygen from the air. The inward movement of air is called inspiration. Our brains regulate the rate and depth of breathing. The exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen happens in the alveoli, which are the tiny air sacs in the lungs. Whenever the alveoli function is impaired, carbon dioxide builds up and oxygenation declines. Changes in this function occur in smoking and diseases like asthma. Our first medication class is anti-influenza agents. These medications, they ease symptoms of the flu and they decrease how long you're sick, but they don't cure the flu or they don't stop it from spreading to others. A popular example of this is Osoltamivir or Tamiflu. These medications need to be started though as soon as possible with the first signs of the flu to within two days of exposure. Remember, antivirals end in VIR. Side effects are vomiting and nausea, ill feeling and insomnia and rash. Antitussives stop a cough by blocking the cough reflex. They're used for dry, non-productive coughs. These medications help patients to rest, especially at night. An example of this is the narcotic coating. Remember our side effects of narcotics, A, B, C, D, 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 apnea, bradycardia, and blood pressure, constipation, dysphoria, dysuria, and dyspepsia. So in general, though, watch for sedation with these medications, which means patient safety is a concern. Expectorants increase the body's ability to clear the lungs and upper airway by thinning the secretions. An example of this is guafenicin or mucinex. These medications come in syrup, tablets, or capsules. Decongestants constrict blood vessels and mucous membranes of the nose, and they reduce nasal passage drainage. They're available as nasal sprays and oral medications. Topical nasal sprays offer immediate relief, but are for short-term use only. In addition, these meds are not to be used in children younger than two years old. These medications are also combined with other types of medications for cold and allergy symptoms. Pseudoephedrine is an example of this medication. As we talked about in previous chapters, antiviral medications are used to prevent the growth of a virus. Remember, viruses can't be killed, but antivirus medications can stop the virus from duplicating, which decreases the duration of a viral illness. RCV or respiratory syncytial virus is a common virus that affects small infants and it's very contagious. With RSV, secretions can become extremely thick. Ribovirin is a medication that's used for this and it's a continuous aerosol treatment for three to five days. This medication, however, can have serious teratogenic effects causing a risk to a developing fetus. This medication can also damage contact lenses and in turn damage your eyes. So when visitors come and healthcare workers, when they're there, they need to be educated on the side effects of these medications. Many illnesses are caused by bacterial infections and antibiotic medications are used for these infections. We may give antibiotics IM to kind of jumpstart that process or in serious cases, we can give IV antibiotics for infections like pneumonia. One bacteria, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, causes a highly contagious infection, TB. This bacteria stays in the patient's body for a lifetime and it can be reactivated if the infection isn't treated. INH and rifampin are common medications that are used, but usually a combination of up to four antibiotics are used over a period of six to 12 months. 
Rifampton can change the urine, sweat, and tears to an orange color, so we should educate our patient about this. For patients with latent TB, this means that a person is infected with TB, but, it's, but they're without the disease. They're treated with one antibiotic for 6 to 12 months. COPD is characterized by an airflow limitation. There is no cure for this disease. Cumulative chronic exposure to cigarette smoke, this is the number one cause, but repeated exposure to secondhand smoke, air pollution, and occupational exposures like coal or they say cotton or grains, these are also important risk factors. The main diseases included under COPD are chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Bronchitis is inflammation of the bronchial, and with emphysema, the bronchioles lose the elasticity and the alveoli dilate beyond their effectiveness. We use a variety of medications depending on patient's symptoms. Supplemental oxygen may be given for dyspnea or shortness of breath, but must be used with caution. Normal healthy people, we respond to rising carbon dioxide levels in our blood. This drives our respiration. COPD patients are different. They breathe in response to low O2 levels in their blood. Care must be given if we give oxygen to these patients. Oxygen must only be given at low levels at a maximum of four liters per minute. If too much oxygen is given to the COPD patient, they can stop breathing. Bronchial dilators, mucolytics, expectorants, and our corticosteroids may be used for treatment of COPD. Our next disorder is asthma, and this disease is caused by an increased restriction of the tracheal bronchial tree to stimulus that results in episodes of narrowing and swelling of the airway. This mnemonic here shows the medications used to treat asthma. Medications to treat asthma include A is our adrenergics, our steroids, theophylin, leukotriene blockers, mast cell inhibitors, and anticholinergics. A is for adrenergic. These adrenergic drugs stimulate the beta-2 receptors in the lungs, which result in bronchial dilation. If you remember from our nervous system studies, these receptors are turned on by the sympathetic nervous system with fight or flight. These meds end in EROL, and albuterol is a very common beta-2 agonist. Since the sympathetic nervous system is activated, think about your side effects. We can get increased blood pressure, increased increase blood glucose, tremors, tachycardia, and headache. It's important to note that if your patient has a steroid inhaler ordered also, they need to do that bronchial dilator, that adrenergic first, to open their airway, then wait for five minutes, and then do their steroid inhaler. You know, we also have epinephrine or adrenaline. This may be given sub-Q for severe dyspnea or shortness of breath that's associated with asthma. People with severe allergies may carry and should carry EpiPens for emergencies. S is for steroids. Here we are again. As we've seen through our studies, glucocorticoids suppress the immune system. So by doing this, we're decreasing the inflammation in the airway for these patients with respiratory problems. Medications such as prednisone can be taken by mouth daily or glucocorticoids can be given by inhalation to prevent asthma attacks. Fluticasone or Flovent is a very popular inhaler that's a corticosteroid. When inhaled steroids though, patients need to be taught to always rinse out their mouth after they use these because this helps prevent fungal infections. Remember these medications have the O-N-E ending, the number one drug. So for treatment of severe acute asthma attacks or shortness of breath with COPD, we can give methylprednisone. That can be given IV to help dilate the airways by taking that inflammation down. These medications should only be taken for a short amount of time because of the immune system suppression. Our T is for theophylline, which is a xanthine. These medications relax the smooth muscle in the airway and they relieve bronchospasm. It's, now they're used, mainly used most commonly to treat asthma. You know, you can give um, theophylline IV. It may be given as a continuous IV infusion in serious asthma attacks, 
We have other forms we can give aminophilin or theophylline PO. However, these medications have a very narrow safety margin, so careful monitoring is essential. Patients must take these meds as directed because of this narrow margin, and we also can do theophylline blood levels to see that we're in a therapeutic range. When patients are taking these medications too, caffeine, which is also a xanthine, should be avoided in large amounts. H is for HALT leukotrienes or leukotriene blocker, blockers, leukotriene receptor inhibitors. These medications have a KAST ending like monoleucast or Singular is the brand name you've probably heard of. Leukotrienes are chemicals that cause bronchoconstriction and they increase mucus. So if we can block these chemicals, we can help prevent asthma attacks or Sometimes these meds are used for long-term control of asthma. They're taken at nighttime to prevent asthma at night, and they can improve breathing in the morning. These medications are not to be used in children under 10 or for nursing mothers. Our M is for mast cell stabilizers. Mast cell stabilizers, they inhibit allergy cells called mast cells from bursting open and releasing substances that cause inflammation. They help prevent or decrease attacks by decreasing the body's reaction to asthma triggers. These medications do not stop an asthma attack. These medications are prophylactically given, but they're not really a bronchodilator or an anti-inflammatory medication. However, though, these meds may be given for patients that have exercise-induced asthma. They're taken about 15 minutes before exercise. Chromalin sodium is an example of a mast cell stabilizer. Side effects include throat irritation, bad taste, wheezing, and cough. And lastly, our A is for anticholinergics. These are bronchodilators and they're used to treat bronchitis, symphysema, and COPD. Remember our peripheral nervous system in Dollsville, right? Defecation, dige digestion, urination, lacrimation, learning, salivation. So our anticholinergics block the action of acetylcholine and are used to prevent, not treat, bronchospasm. They also help dry secretions. There's that anticholinergic effect. So let's think about turning off the peripheral nervous system so we can expect some fight or flight response, bronchodilation, side effects, tremors. And these anticholinergic effects we can see like dry mouth, blurry vision, and confusion. These medications end in PIUM. Examples are ipotropium, or atrovent, and tiotropium, like spiriva. Oxygen is used to treat hypoxia, low oxygenation. As just mentioned, it's also used to manage dyspnea in COPD patients. It can be delivered by nasal cannula, mask, endotracheal tube, hood, or tent. O2 is considered a medication, so therefore we have to have a physician's order for it. As healthcare professionals, we need to make sure that we deliver only the amount of oxygen that is ordered. Too much oxygen can damage the eyes, especially those of premature infants, and they can cause the COPD patient to stop breathing. Well, that's it on our respiratory medications. If you have any questions, bring them to the Farm Cafe.